Welcome to The Naked Lawyer. Big data reveals why you're at risk. I'm Margaret George, the Deputy Director at LIF, the Lawyers Insurance Fund. And I'm Mary Ann Pearl, Claims Counsel. Let's start with a question. What do 15 years and the close to 15,000 reports of claims and potential claims that LIF received in those 15 years from BC lawyers tell us? First, that almost 14,000 of those reports were avoidable. In 95% of reports to LIF, effective risk management would have either avoided the claim entirely or reduced the lawyer's exposure to the claim. And second, that there are five key underlying causes of those reports. And we know this because for the past 15 years, we've identified the underlying cause of each report. And we've used a sophisticated, nuanced coding system that allows us to tell where the risk of a claim really lies. And we've determined that it's in one of five key areas. And finally, that effective risk management could have significantly reduced the roughly $170 million in settlements, judgments, and defense costs that LIF paid out in those 15 years. So that brings us to our purpose today, to give you the information that you need to avoid claims. And here's how we're going to do it. Using big data, we're going to reveal each of the underlying causes of claims one by one. And we just note here that we've used the term big data a little loosely. It's not really the big data of analytics. But to us, the data is big, 15 years worth, and it tells us a lot about what causes claims. We're then going to explain each of the causes in detail. And for this, we'll use real life examples from our claim files including uh, stories from 10 of our colleagues at LIF who you're going to meet through short video clips. We think that the understanding you'll have of why you're at risk is going to help you determine what steps you need to take to manage that risk. After we've revealed all of the five key causes, we're going to do some comparisons by area of practice. We think you'll find that interesting. And finally, we'll show you uh, where you can find the risk management material and tips that we've produced over the years. We think that the deeper understanding you'll have after today's session of uh, where you are at risk in your own practice will help you determine the material most relevant to you, and we'll just remind you where to find that. But before we begin, we've told you that 95% of reports are avoidable. What about the other 5%? Well, that's the bad news. 5% of claims cannot be effectively risk management managed. There's really nothing you can do except live with this risk. It's small, uh, and it's just that bad things happen sometimes. And we'll give you an example of this unmanageable risk from one of our claim files. The lawyer here acted for the mother in a custody dispute. The lawyer was later sued for malpractice. Now, the plaintiff was not, as you would expect, the lawyer's former client, the mother, alleging negligence of some sort. The plaintiff was, in fact, the father for whom the lawyer clearly did not act. The father, who also happened to be a lawyer, alleged that our lawyer's advice to her client resulted in his access to his children being reduced. Some might say not an unusual outcome in any custody dispute. In any event, and happily for this lawyer, we were able to get the claim against her dismissed summarily on the basis that it disclosed no plausible cause of action. So that's the bad news. The good news is that most reports are avoidable. So let's get started and see what the big data tells us about those 13,838 avoidable reports. One housekeeping matter before Marianne kicks off. Uh, our, we have a lot to cover today and our time is quite full, but we will tell you before we finish how to get any questions you might have about anything you hear today answered. Marianne? Thanks, Margaret. Our first key cause of claims 
About 20% of the reports we receive relate to something we call engagement, retainer or non-retainer management, managing the process of providing legal services. These failures have nothing to do with your competence as a lawyer, but everything to do with your approach to delivering legal services. We see failures here because lawyers don't always appreciate why effective management is necessary or question its practicality or benefit. What else does a big data reveal? First, that half of all these failures relate to not managing client expectations. These problems arise when you fail to appreciate the risk inherent in a client or their expectations. Even if there's really no merit to the claim, you're targeted because your client is unhappy. And we can give you more details because the data also tells us that 50% of these reports relate to expectations of a legal process. What any lawyer can realistically accomplish for a client. These claims often involve a high needs client whose expectations of a legal outcome aren't brought into line with a legal reality. We're going to give you an example of that in a video clip in a moment. 35% relate to expectations of the retainer, who is doing what, or whether or not you're even retained. Here's an example. A lawyer met with a potential client wanting to bring a Wills Variation Act claim and sent a retainer letter to the client to sign and return. The letter didn't clearly state that the client was to sign the letter and return it. When the limitation for starting the Wills Variation Act claim was missed, the lawyer told us he'd never been retained. Of course, the claimant said he was. And 15% relate to the client's expectations of how much it's ultimately going to cost. An example that's very typical of what we see, a lawyer successfully defended her client in a civil suit and sends her account. The account was apparently higher than what the client was expecting, and he refused to pay. The lawyer later commenced an action for recovery of her fees, only to be faced with a counterclaim that alleged all sorts of negligence in the handling of the defense. Our next claim file example involves a lawyer's failure to effectively manage his client's expectations of the legal process. And to tell the story in this video clip, we'll hear from one of our newer claims counsel, Lamour Afonso. I'm a new recruit here at the Lawyers Insurance Fund, but I have a story that I'd like to share as I think it demonstrates one of the key reasons why lawyers report themselves to us, and that is not effectively managing a client's expectations. In this file, a senior lawyer represented a wife in a family law matter. The couple had lived in a common law relationship for just over two years and had recently broken up. The wife was very eager to have matters settled. The main asset was a townhouse that the couple had purchased together. They had each contributed $75,000 towards the down payment and had borrowed the rest, which they secured by way of a mortgage. The initial thought was that they would sell the townhouse, pay off the mortgage, and then split any remaining equity 50-50. The husband made an offer to buy out the wife's interest in the townhouse for $100,000. The lawyer, not knowing what the townhouse was worth, recommended that the wife obtain an appraisal so that they could properly assess the settlement offer. The wife was undergoing some emotional distress from the breakup of the relationship, as well as some health issues. She dismissed the husband's offer as being too low, and also dismissed the recommendation for an appraisal as she thought she knew what the townhouse was worth. She asked the lawyer to defer the sale of the townhouse until the spring, when construction on the townhouse complex would be complete and the townhouse would be worth more, or so it seemed. In the spring, the husband made another offer to purchase the wife's interest in the townhouse. This time it was not for $100,000. The purchase price would be based on the appraisal of the property. He offered to pay 50% of any remaining equity in the townhouse after the mortgage had been paid off based on its appraised value. This time the wife said to the lawyer that she just wanted to get matters over with and to go ahead and accept the settlement offer. When the appraised value of the townhouse came in, it was much less than what the wife had expected. She would only receive $50,000, which was much less than the initial offer of $100,000, 
and was less than the $75,000 down payment that she had made. She balked and resolved from the settlement. She said to the lawyer that at a minimum, she thought she would get her down payment back, and she thought she had made that very clear to the lawyer. Under the circumstances, the lawyer could no longer act for the wife, and she filed a notice of intention to act in person. The lawyer said that in hindsight, he should have explained more clearly the risk of not obtaining the appraisal and the importance of having one in negotiating a fair settlement. In this case, the wife never did bring a claim against the lawyer. He had a small outstanding fee account, but he decided not to pursue payment. So that's an example of not managing client expectations, but we also see managing expectation problems in another area. Not appreciating that someone for whom you're clearly not acting thinks that you are somehow protecting their interests. Here's an example. A lawyer acted for a company and received funds from an investor. The investor was to receive shares for his investment, and he did. However, when the stock didn't perform as well, the lawyer reported to us because the now unhappy investor suggested that the lawyer owed him a duty of care in relation to the investment. The next two engagement management issues relate to the effective management of the retainer, setting it up and concluding it. Let's start with the lawyer's failure right at the start of the retainer to think through how they're going to deliver the legal services. We see this creating problems in two different contexts. In about 70% of these reports, the lawyer is acting on an entirely new legal matter. This is where we see most of our conflict issues. The lawyer doesn't adequately consider whether or not he or she is ethically able to represent all the parties. For an example of this risk, we'll hear from Corin Cooper Stevenson in this video clip. I wish I could say that I've only had one file like this, but over the years I've had a number of reports from solicitors who are so busy trying to get the deal done for their client that they don't actually stop to consider who that client really is. I had a report last year from a lawyer who had acted for a manufacturing company for a number of years. Over that time, he had done a lot of work for the company and also for the principal shareholder of the company and his wife. He had come to be good friends with the principal shareholder. They would golf together once a month, they would go for dinner together with their wives, things like that. They got along quite well. At some point, the company got into some financial trouble and needed to go looking for financing in order to be able to carry on with its operations. The lawyer got involved and was able to find private financing to help out the company. That financing came with a requirement that the shareholder and his wife provide security in the form of a mortgage over their principal residence. Having negotiated the deal, the lawyer called up the shareholder and his wife, had them into the office, and they signed up the documents. Well, if you haven't already guessed, ultimately the company defaulted on its obligations under the loan. Foreclosure proceedings were started, and the house was sold in those proceedings. Having lost their family home, the only real option available to the couple was to bring an action against the lawyer. In that action, the couple alleged that the lawyer hadn't properly considered or advised them on their rights under the agreement and the ramifications of granting this mortgage. The lawyer had been so busy trying to get this deal accomplished that in his mind, the company, the shareholder, and his wife all had the same interests. He hadn't stopped to consider that the shareholder, and certainly his wife, should be sent out for independent legal advice. In this particular case, we were successful in defending the claim and no damages were paid, but it's a simple example of an issue that I've seen come up more often than I would like. So that's a story about the risk in the context of a new matter. In the remaining 30% of these reports, the matter isn't new. Rather, the lawyer has inherited a file from another lawyer. Here's what happens. Because another lawyer previously acted, the new lawyer tends to be more casual in their approach to the legal issues and required steps, assuming that the first lawyer has already considered or dealt with a matter. An example? A lawyer inherited a personal injury motor vehicle file in which the action was already underway. He thought all was in order, so he didn't bother to review the file thoroughly at the outset. In fact, there was a draft consent order in the file that had not been signed 
entered or filed or sent to opposing counsel. But the, by the time this was discovered, the court found it was too late to add the parties and part of the claim was missed. Those are the key risks when setting a retainer up. The next relates to not concluding effectively. These mistakes often happen because the work is done and the lawyer moves on without ensuring that the final wrap-up details are properly attended to. An example, a lawyer acted for a creditor on a debt collection matter, got judgment and closed the file, but forgot to advise the client that there was a 10-year limitation for collecting on the judgment, a limitation that was subsequently missed. And finally, we see files in which the lawyer properly acts on a joint retainer and a conflict later develops. We've seen this in different situations, including where a lawyer properly acts for an insured and an insurer, but an issue then arises that creates a conflict. The lawyer does not step back and recognize that he or she is acting for parties who are in fact now adverse in interest and take the appropriate steps to deal with the conflict. That's the first key underlying cause. So, as you've heard, the first key cause, engagement management, relates to the process of providing legal services. The next three key causes all relate to how lawyers deliver the legal product. And the big data tells us that the first of these is failing to sort out the legal issues or strategies required to achieve a client's goal. 26% of reports to LIF. Now the big data also tells us that we can drill down further and see that there are two distinct problems that lead to these failures. First, ignorance of the law, about a third of the legal issue failures. And what happens here is that you have some knowledge, but you don't appreciate the limits on that knowledge, so you don't dig into the law to determine what it actually is in relation to a particular matter. And for our claim file example, we're going to hear this story from Surinder Niger. The example I'm going to talk about today involves a real estate claim, which is one of our busiest areas and is somewhat unique in that we see an uptick in claims both when there is a decline in the market and an increase in the market. In a rising market, we'll see vendors that are trying to get out of their deals, and in a falling market, we'll see purchasers who are trying to get out of their deals. And inevitably, somebody will point the finger at the lawyer for messing up the closing. In this particular example, the client had entered into a contract to purchase 30 or 40 lots that were to be subdivided from a larger parcel. Uh, it had paid several millions of dollars for the purchase price, or contracted to pay, and had paid a deposit of several hundreds of thousands of dollars. When the client came to my lawyer, uh, the client was looking to get out of the deal, both because the market had declined, but also because the client was simply in over its head. My lawyer reviewed the matter and determined that the vendor was in breach of REDMA, the Real Estate Development Marketing Act for failing to provide a disclosure statement to the purchaser. As a result, he thought the purchaser had an out and sent along a notice of rescission to the vendor's lawyer. The vendor's lawyer, who was a little bit uh, better versed in the operation of RADMA as it was one of his practice areas, determined that RADMA actually didn't apply because this was a sale from a developer to another developer. He took the position that the notice of rescission was an anticipatory breach, accepted the repudiation, and took the position that the deposit had been forfeited. My lawyer then reviewed the matter further and concluded that the vendor's counsel was correct and reported the matter to us. We subsequently paid approximately half a million dollars to resolve the claim, which of course triggered my lawyer's uh, deductible and surcharge, with the deductible being $5,000 and the surcharge being $1,000 per year for five years. So it ended up being a $10,000 hit for my lawyer which he could have avoided had he just spent a little bit more time in reviewing the act and its operation. And it just goes to show you that sometimes having a little bit of knowledge can be a dangerous thing. So that's an example of a lawyer caught short practicing in an area in which he wasn't fully conversant. 
the remaining two-thirds of legal issue failures are the result of not thinking it through. Here, you know the law, so that's not an issue, but you don't fully consider all of the legal strategies, issues, or steps required to get your client what they want. We're going to hear two stories here, and they arise in very different situations, but as you'll see, both would have been avoided if the lawyers involved had stopped and fully considered all of the legal building blocks required to create the product the client was looking for. So our first claim file example uh, is with Kate McLean in this video clip. I want to tell you about a claim involving a tax matter that's an excellent example of the need to think through whether a firm precedent will actually accomplish the client's goal. It's also a good news story in the sense that we were able to fix the problem to everyone's satisfaction. Uh, the facts aren't unusual in the tax context. The shares of a family company built up by mom and dad, we'll call it ABC Co, were left to their children. The children sought tax planning advice to ensure that the growth in ABC would be treated tax effectively. In a nutshell, the plan called for each of the siblings to incorporate a holding company and to create a family trust. Each sibling would be the trustee of the family trust and their children, mom and dad's grandchildren, would be the beneficiaries. So the family trust would hold the shares in the holding company, which would in turn hold the growth shares in ABC Co. In that way, growth in the, uh, in the family company would accrue to the trust via the holding companies. It was a critical aspect of the plan that in addition to maintaining control, the siblings could be added as beneficiaries to the trust themselves if they chose to do so. So the plan was put in place, flash forward a few years, to when ABC sold substantial assets and management of the company decided to declare a dividend. It's at that point that each of the siblings decided they wanted to be added as beneficiaries of their respective trusts in order to participate uh, in the flow of funds through the holding company to the trust. That's when the problem came to light. It turns out the trust deed contained no power to add anyone to the class of beneficiaries or to modify the trust at all. The matter was reported to us and the immediate question was, what can we do? Can we fix this? Two options were identified. The first was to seek rectification of the trust by court order, and the second was to consider the creation of a series of sub-trusts. For a number of reasons, our Tax Repair Council recommended the non-rectification route in the particular circumstances of this case. So the assets of each trust were appointed to a sub-trust on substantially the same terms as the original trust deed, but with the inclusion of language permitting the addition of individuals to the class of beneficiaries, including siblings. While the tax plan and the repair were much more complicated than this, of course, the lesson is a simple one. The stress to the insured, and more particularly to the client, as well as the cost of the repair could all have been avoided if the lawyer who implemented the plan had considered whether the, tr the precedent she was about to use actually accommodated or frustrated the client's objectives. In this case, one size didn't fit all. So that's one situation. Here's another example in a very different context. But as you'll see, we're really dealing fundamentally with the same sort of problem. We'll hear next from Leanne Wood. This story demonstrates the importance of thinking through all of the requisite steps in a litigation matter to make out your client's claim or defense, not only for judgment at trial, but also to preserve it as best you can from attack on appeal. This claim arose in a town on Vancouver Island where the clients and the lawyer had lived and worked for many years. Both were well known around town. 
The clients had fallen on hard times and needed money. The specifics involved a piece of industrial real estate that the clients had purchased. The site was contaminated and required extensive remediation to make it suitable for its intended use. The clients retained our insured to recover the remediation costs from the former owner whom the client said had contaminated the site. The claim went to trial. The defendant was unrepresented at trial and did a terrible job of defending itself, resulting in an award in which the plaintiffs got everything they were looking for. The client at this stage was of course very happy with the outcome. The defendant then retained counsel and appealed the judgment. The Court of Appeal was concerned about the evidentiary record at trial, specifically that the plaintiff hadn't proven the documents it relied on at trial and that many of the facts on which the damages award was based had not been proven. The Court of Appeal was also quite critical of the lawyer's work at trial and the lawyer's handling of the evidence both before the trial and during. The court pointed out that many of the problems could have been prevented if the lawyer had made better use of the rules of court prior to trial. The court pointed out that regardless of the quality of the opposition, the lawyer still needed to prove the elements of the case and should not have taken such a relaxed approach just because there was not much of a defense being mounted. The Court of Appeal ordered a new trial. Unfortunately, the necessary evidence was no longer available. The client was partly to blame for this, but so was a lawyer for not securing the evidence in the first place and not preserving the evidence. At the end of the day, the claim was dismissed. The clients then blamed the lawyer for what was by now a real mess. We had some defenses, but it was difficult to overcome the Court of Appeal's unfavorable comments on the lawyer's performance. We held an informal mediation at the client's premises and the lawyer formally apologized to the clients for his work. We were able to resolve the claim and the lawyer gave up a significant amount of unpaid fees. This claim could have been prevented if the lawyer had taken more time to think through the legal steps required to properly make out the claim and to preserve the result from appeal. So let's move from those examples of legal issue failures to our next key cause. Thanks, Margaret. This next category also relates to how effectively lawyers deliver legal services. Failures in listening, asking, explaining account for 15% of reports. These reports often involve lawyers making assumptions that later prove wrong and heads up that you are particularly at risk when dealing with sophisticated clients or with routine matters. And digging a little more deeply, we find that, not surprisingly, 70% of the communication problems we see are between lawyers and their own clients. And we can give you more details because the data also tells us that those communication issues can be broken down further. In 45% of the reports, the lawyer knows the proper advice to give, but just doesn't communicate it effectively. In 35%, the lawyer knows exactly what facts are needed to determine the legal issues at play, but isn't able to effectively ask or listen to discover them. And the final 20% relate to not asking for instructions or consent. Again, usually because you assume you know what your client wants. And we'll hear an example of how a communication breakdown led to a report to LIF in this video clip from Richard Panton. So on this file, the lawyer had acted for the client on a number of other occasions in the past. The client was a relatively sophisticated commercial entity. It owned real estate, it owned businesses, and it also made commercial loans. So here, our lawyer receives a package of material on his desk. There was no cover letter. Uh, there was no phone call from the client warning that this material was coming, so there were no instructions. Now this wasn't terribly unusual for this client. They had done business this way in the past and they always followed up with instructions later by telephone. So our lawyer took a quick look at the documents and then he put them on the corner of his desk. He did see the, the materials included a uh, signed loan agreement, a signed indemnity agreement, and a fully executed but unregistered mortgage over real property. So again, he put the materials on the corner of his desk and he waited for the phone call. And of course, this is the one time where that phone call never came. The days turn into weeks, the weeks turn into months, the lawyer became wrapped up with other files, 
and he never did make the phone call to the client himself. It wasn't until several months later that the parties finally touched base on this file. The client asked the lawyer, did you register the mortgage that I gave you? The lawyer said, well, no, you didn't give me instructions to do that. The client was a little bit put out by this, but they decided to simply register the mortgage there and then. Of course, during the intervening period, the debtor had granted another mortgage on the same property. The client's mortgage now stood in second place, and months later, the loan was called, the debtor went bankrupt, and the second place mortgage turned out to be worthless because of the intervening charge on title. So the lawyer was sued. The plaintiff did eventually compromise its claim on the basis of its own lack of diligence in giving timely instructions to the lawyer, but it won't surprise you to know that the plaintiff was able to bolster its case with an expert report that essentially said that the failure to seek instructions in a more timely fashion constituted the breach of the standard of care in the circumstances. So the matter settled at mediation. Um, the problem here wasn't so much that the lawyer forgot about the documents or forgot to register the mortgage documents. The problem here was a communications breakdown. This was a long-standing, sophisticated client. The relationship had worked well in the past. They became accustomed to doing things a certain way. And here, this time, each party assumed the other would take the next step. And of course, neither of them did. All it would have taken in the circumstances was a quick email or phone call to seek instructions or to arrange a time to talk. That's an example of a communication failure between a lawyer and a client. The remaining 30% of communication issues relate to commu communication with non-clients. We can tell you that drilling down further into the data shows us two different contexts for these communication issues. Just over half relate to communication with other counsel involved. And just under half relate to communications with the other people you rely on to get, help you get the job done for your client, as in this example. A lawyer acted for a lender and routinely obtained certificates of judgment in relation to properties owned by the debtors. This time, when the certificate of judgment came in, the lawyer told his assistant to just do the same thing as she had previously done on all the other files. The lawyer wrongly assumed that this meant to file the judgment in the land title office. His secretary didn't realize that this is what the lawyer wanted and it wasn't filed. Unfortunately, before the slip was discovered, another judgment was registered in priority. And before we leave this key cause, we'd like to quote an excerpt from a 2013 decision out of Ontario dealing with a solicitor's negligence claim. In finding that the lawyer and the law firm involved were professionally negligent, the court made this observation. As the discussion of the facts will reveal, like many professional negligence cases, the lawyer's error does not show incompetence, unskillfulness, lethargy, or inattention. Like many negligence cases, their error is a failure in communication. Thus, the critical facts are what was said, what was not said, what was described, what was misdescribed, what was clear, what was opaque, what was understood, and what was misunderstood. With that judicial comment on the risk of communication failures, let's move to our fourth key cause. Thanks, Marianne. So, you're good on the legal end, and your communication skills are terrific, but something still goes wrong. What is it? Our final key risk relating to the delivery of the legal product, those often simple, always inadvertent oversights. And at 37%, the leading cause of reports to LIF. And we note here that many of the reports that we receive from oversights are from lawyers at small firms and big firms who are generally systematic and careful. Virtual, virtually all of the oversights that we see are the result of breakdowns in the basic legal or administrative routines of the practice or the individual lawyer. And digging a bit deeper shows us that we can break 
oh, break down oversights into three distinct categories. First, 30% of oversights by lawyers or their staff are the result of system breakdowns. In these, the mistake would have been avoided through an effective firm-wide system. And we should note here that usually in these reports, the firms have systems. The problems are that either those systems are flawed or their mistakes are made by the people using or relying on the system. The vast majority of these system failures are relating to diary systems that, of course, leading to mislimitations. And the rest, the remaining 15%, relate to other systems that firms could have in place to help, to help them avoid problems. For instance, systems to help manage file maintenance or storage or wills or uh, corporate records. So for an example of our systems problem, we're going to hear next from uh, Greg Sexton in this video clip. Greg is a, another recent addition to the Lyft team. I recently joined the Lawyers Insurance Fund, and one thing that I've noticed is a lot of the claims we receive are for missed limitation periods. In fact, I understand about one quarter of all reports relate to missed limitation periods or another deadline that's facing a client. For example, we have one case involving a lawyer who was acting for his friend who had suffered injuries in a motor vehicle accident. The lawyer was a well-respected litigator in a downtown Vancouver firm. The firm did a lot of personal injury work and it had an electronic diary system to track limitation periods. The accident occurred in about June 2010 and the client came in to see the lawyer several months later. But the client's timing was bad for two reasons. First, the lawyer was leaving on vacation to Europe that evening and he was desperate to get out of the office. Secondly, the lawyer had just retained a new assistant and the assistant had no litigation experience. The assistant opened the file properly. She physically wrote the limitation period inside the file, but she failed to enter it into the electronic system. So over the next few years, the lawyer met with the client informally in the neighborhood. They talked about the case, they talked about her injuries, and they decided that they were going to wait until her injuries stabilized before proceeding with trying to settle the claim. It wasn't until May 2014, so this is almost one full year after the limitation period had expired, that the lawyer noticed that he missed the limitation period. So he called us immediately. He was embarrassed and distraught and frustrated with himself and how he handled the file. He realized that he gave instructions to his new assistant far too quickly because he was trying desperately to get out of the office on vacation, and he assumed that she'd received the appropriate office training. What he should have done is have another assistant more experienced with the firm system enter the required information. He also noted that he'd fallen into a far more informal approach than usual on this file because of his friendship with his client, so he missed the usual reviews that might have alerted him to the pending limitation beforehand. We tried everything we could to save the file, including extending the limitation period, but there was nothing that could be done. So we ended up paying several hundred thousand dollars to resolve the matter given the client's extensive injuries. So this really shows that the best systems are often only as good as the people using them. Turning back to our example, our lawyer told us that his firm has now implemented a further system in addition to their electronic diary system in that they physically review all files with limitation requirements three times per year. So that's a story uh, with a variation on a very common theme that we see in reports to LIF. The next category of oversights in 65% of these claims, the lawyer has just forgotten, overlooked, or put off taking some step that needs to be taken. And we know from drilling down even further into the data that these kind of oversights occur in three different contexts. 25% are the inadvertent clerical errors that we make when we're drafting documents. 20% are the result of failing to carefully review relevant file material and so missing something as a result. And in the remaining 55%, the lawyer just forgets, delays, just drops the ball. We're going to hear two stories for this category. And in the first, we'll hear from Marlon Song. And he's going to share a story with us that really demonstrates the difficulties that can flow 
from simple mistakes both in document preparation and document review. A lawyer was retained by a husband and wife to assist with completing a residential real estate purchase of what was to be their primary residence. Years after the transaction had closed, one late Friday afternoon, the lawyer received a panic call from the wife. It was a call the lawyer would never forget. The wife advised the lawyer that her husband had recently passed away and when she proceeded to take steps to transmit title to their home into her name, a home that her and her husband had been living in for well over 10 years, she was shocked to discover that contrary to their mutual instructions, title to their home had been registered to them as tenants in common, as opposed to joint tenants. Obviously, the lawyer took immediate steps to recover the original file from closed storage. While the lawyer was waiting for the file, she couldn't help but think perhaps the wife's recollection was correct. The wife had told the lawyer that her and her husband had been happily married for well over 25 years, and during that time, they had purchased other properties, all of which were held in their names as joint tenants. The lawyer could also remember the wife saying that all their other assets, such as banking and investment accounts, had been held in their names as joint tenants. When the lawyer reviewed the file, she noted that indeed the original instructions from her clients were to register the property into their names as joint tenants. As a matter of fact, located at the top of the conveyance file was a copy of her reporting letter addressed to both the husband and the wife, stating that not only the purchase transaction had closed successfully, but also that property was held in their names as joint tenants. The lawyer also examined a copy of this original state of title certificate that she had enclosed with her reporting letter, and it was at that time the reality of what happened hit her. She had not only failed to ensure that the Form A transfer had been prepared in accordance with her client's express instructions, but she had also failed to review the Form A transfer both prior to it being sent out to the vendor's lawyer for execution, but also before it was actually filed to the land title registry. As a result of the erroneous registration, the husband's will may need to be probated, which meant the wife would be forced to pay as much as $25,000 in unanticipated fees and costs associated with probating her late husband's will. To make matters worse, the husband had children from a previous marriage. So there was the added risk of a potential WVA claim being asserted by one or both of these children. If a successful WVA claim was made, the wife could quite possibly end up losing more than just the fees and disbursements associated with probating her husband's will, but also lose up to an amount equivalent to half the value of the home plus the additional cost of having to deal with a WVA claim. Thankfully in the end, the matter was fixed by obtaining a court ordered rectification of the title. I just wanted to add a note here that the types of mistakes that uh, reference, were referenced by Marlon in his story can have really big consequences. And there's quite a dramatic example of this in this story out of the States. Here's what happened. AT&T, the giant telecom company, missed a deadline to appeal a jury verdict for $27.5 million awarded against it in a patent infringement case. AT&T applied to extend the deadline, but the trial judge, and he was upheld on appeal, refused. Why? Well, he found that there was a faulty uh, court docket notice, but that wasn't enough. He wouldn't grant the extension because he also found that at least 18 lawyers and assistants had had the opportunity to read the actual order that clearly set the deadline out in black and white. So we're going to hear um, in our next claim file example from our claims manager, Murray Patterson, and he's going to talk about a story in which the lawyer just dropped the ball. We see a lot of reports where a lawyer uh, fails to uh, take a step that needs to be uh, taken in a matter or just uh, forgets or doesn't get around to doing it and that can cause problems. Sometimes uh, even if the lawyer gets around to taking this step eventually it still causes problems due to the delay in taking it as uh, in this example of a wills and estate claim that um, we received. Uh, in this case our lawyer had acted for a long time for uh, an individual who had passed away. The deceased estate uh, consisted uh, primarily 
of uh, shares in a publicly traded company, I'll call Company X, that at the time of the death of the uh, deceased were worth uh, several hundreds of thousands of dollars. Now, the uh, personal representative uh, of the estate uh, was the sister of the deceased, and most of the beneficiaries were charities. Uh, the charities preferred to receive uh, their bequests in cash, uh, so the uh, personal representative had to have the estate probated uh, so the shares could be transferred into her name and she could instruct the broker to liquidate them. Uh, hence, she uh, instructed uh, our insured to uh, probate the estate. Now, our insured was a sole practitioner and he had a very limited wills and estates practice and so his support staff was not versed in uh, preparing probate documents. To make the matters worse, our insured was preparing for an impending lengthy trial but nevertheless he took the retainer feeling that he could get around to probating the estate in due course. Uh, after he finished the trial, not surprisingly, he had a, a number of pressing urgent matters that had backed up so again he put off attending to probating the estate then he forgot about it and when he remembered, he uh, simply put it at the bottom of his file. Now you'd think that somebody would uh, be pressing him to uh, move forward with this, but in this case there really wasn't a squeaky wheel. Uh, the personal representative, the sister, uh, lived most of the time in Arizona in her second home and she wasn't receiving any money so wasn't pushing the matter. And the beneficiaries were of course charities, i.e. institutions that weren't saying show me the money and we're just waiting for the estate to be probated in due course. Now eventually our insured after many many months got around to probating the estate but as it happened just prior to uh, filing for probate the fall of 2008 huge stock market crash occurred with the result being that the value of uh, the shares in public company X went down from approximately $250,000 to just a bit more than $50,000. On the face of it, a big problem. Now fortunately, this all worked out as the uh, charities um, were sympathetic, they agreed to take the shares in kind, and after several months the share values returned to their pre-recession values and so no claim was made. It doesn't always work out this well, so the lessons to be learned from this is that be careful in taking retainers where you won't necessarily have time to attend to the steps that need to be taken. And don't necessarily think, well, uh, there's no limitation period or other procedural deadline that I can't make because it may be, as in this case and as it often, is often the case in difficult economic times, there can be external factors that you can't even foresee uh, that could uh, impact your client's position as a result of the delay. So don't take a retainer that you can't attend to all steps uh, necessary in a timely manner. So we'll leave that story and move to our final category of oversights. About 5% of these reports involve situation in which the lawyer delegates a task to someone else at the firm, a legal assistant, a paralegal, even an articled student, and the mistake is made by that person in carrying out the task that was delegated to them, but the reason it was made is because they were not properly supervised or trained by the lawyer. Thankfully, we see not that many of these reports, but we could see even fewer. And for our claim file example, we're going to go back uh, to a, uh, a report that arose in the pre-notice of civil claim days. So here's what happened. A lawyer finished preparing a writ and she gave it to her secretary with assistance to please file the writ. Well, the writ was later found, filed in a file folder in a filing cabinet long after the limitation had expired. The assistant, being literal-minded and woefully undertrained, had done exactly what she was asked. So that finishes our key cause relating to the delivery of the legal product. We're going to move now to the final cause, and as you're about to hear, it's nothing to do with whether or not you've provided excellent legal services and everything to do with whether or not you can prove that you did. Marianne? And finally, 
no trail. Clearly a small risk, but worth raising, given that 390 reports could have been avoided entirely. We're going to play a video clip from Sue Forbes QC, the Director of Insurance, that will explain this final cause and give you a great story from the LIF archives. We receive lots of reports in which lawyers find themselves trying to prove that certain advice was given, contrary to what a client now says. Those lawyers search desperately for that note to file or letter or email or something that will corroborate what the lawyer says actually happened and prove their version of events. Often the search is in vain, and we're then into protracted litigation with no certainty that the defense is going to prevail. But not always, and it's the not always that I'm going to talk about today. A report in which the lawyer found that little nugget of evidence. It's also simply the best example I know of how a note to file saved the day for a lawyer. And that message remains as fresh and relevant today as it was when it was reported to us 27 years ago when I first started at Lawyers Insurance Fund. Here's what happened. Our lawyer acted for the purchaser, let's call him Mr. Smith, of a house on rural land. Smith assumed that the house included a very normal looking front yard. The realtor had apparently represented as much. The purchase completed and Smith and his family moved in. He then discovered, much to his dismay, that the neighbor's property line ran diagonally across his front yard, making his big rectangular shaped front yard about half the size and in fact triangular shaped. He sued everyone, the vendor, the realtor, and his lawyer, Mr. Jones. The claim against Jones was that Jones never gave him any advice on boundaries or the value of a survey. Appreciate that 30 years ago, as a purchaser's lawyer, you protected your client from these sorts of issues by recommending that they get a survey done. Jones thought he had dealt with the issue of a survey. So here we have a typical he said, he said situation emerging. Our Supreme Court on more than one occasion has stated, where there is a conflict between the versions of events given by the client and the lawyer, all other things being equal, the client's version is to be preferred. Jones combed through his entire file. What he found saved the day. On his file was a sketchy handwritten note, I can see it clearly right now, upper left hand corner, and this note said, discussed boundaries with S, does not want to obtain survey, will check pins himself. Voila! We now had a real defense to the claim, and there was no question that this one handwritten note strengthened our hand immeasurably when dealing with the lawsuit. In fact, we would have taken this to trial, but for Mr. Jones's reluctance to use his time this way and be put through the stress of a trial. He pragmatically preferred to pay a very small amount from his deductible to settle the matter, and that's exactly what we did. Without that note, however, he and we would have paid a lot more or run the risk of an uncertain result at a trial in which not the lawyers, but the client's version of what happened would likely have been accepted. And with that, you have the five key underlying causes of reports to lift, broken down even further into discrete categories and types of failures that make up each. We'd like to finish off by sharing with you these five causes in a slightly different context. So, as we said at the start, we thought it might interest you to see how the five key causes play out by area of law. Do litigators, for instance, have different exposures than real estate practitioners? Well, the answer, perhaps not surprisingly, is often yes. And we know this because for each of those 14,000 or so avoidable reports we told you about at the beginning, we also know the area of law in which the lawyer responsible for the mistake was practicing. So Mary Ann's now, now going to take us through each of the key causes and show us how they break down by area of law. We'll start with engagement management. You'll recall that this cause includes not managing expectations and not setting up or concluding the retainer effectively. 
Across the board, 19% of reports, but how does it break down? As we can see, in some areas, you're much more prone to this risk than in others. And not surprisingly, it's a higher than average cause in family and criminal, given the risks of not managing client expectations that these practitioners face. It's also higher in corporate. This includes securities, tax, and commercial practices, reflecting the additional risk for these lawyers of not managing third-party expectations. Let's move now to legal issues. This cause is related to not knowing the law, but more frequently to not thinking through all the legal issues in order to achieve your client's goal. On average, 26% of reports. And the breakdown? Not that dissimilar amongst the various areas of law, except for one, as you'll see at 8%. Clearly, there's less risk for IP lawyers. This may be explained by the fact that IP is generally such a specialized area, given its complexity, that lawyers practicing in it tend to know it cold. And now to communication issues. Failures in listening, asking, explaining. On average, 15% of reports. And again, some differences and that you're more at risk in a few areas, wills and estates, real estate and criminal, as you can see with percentages of 21 to 23%. Lawyers in these areas run a higher risk of not checking with the client to get the necessary facts or ensure the client understands the advice given. And next to oversights. Those are the mistakes we make just because something is forgotten missed or overlooked, and include mistakes that diary and other firm-wide systems ought to prevent. On average, 37% of reports. And again, some differences, as you'll see, it's significantly higher for IP lawyers, with the most significant cause of reports for this practice area being inadvertent oversights or system failures. Much less of a risk for family and criminal lawyers. And finally, no trail. Reporting because your client now says X and you can't find any neat confirming note that you actually said Y. 3% of all reports. As you can see, see, the he said, she said without any confirmation is double the risk for criminal lawyers and less for IP and administrative lawyers. Perhaps not surprising given the nature of these practices. And Putting all of this data together, you can see where your greatest risks are. So, what can you do? We called this presentation The Naked Lawyer because we wanted to show where you as a lawyer are bare, where you're vulnerable to claims. And we think that with the knowledge that you now have, you can start to identify areas where you are at risk and look at introducing steps or processes or other tools to help you manage that risk and to help you dress for risk management success just go to our preventing claims information on lift section of the website you'll find all of our risk management material there organized by practice risk as well as area of law if you have any questions about anything you've heard today please do just call or email us. All of our contact information is on the website. So we hope that you found this expose useful and are feeling a little less chilled as you head back to work this afternoon. On behalf of all of us at the Lawyers Insurance Fund, we wanted to thank first CLEBC and its wonderful staff for helping make this production possible and then thank all of you so much for your time today.